Hello everyone, today we're continuing our deep dive of Richard Dawkins and Yan Wong's book, The Ancestor's Tale. In this episode, we're going to discuss invertebrates who are not what they seem. So let's jump right in. In a letter to his second cousin, William Darwin Fox, in 1852, Charles Darwin famously wrote, quote, I hate a barnacle as no man ever did before, not even a sailor in a slow-moving ship, close quote. Darwin pinned four monographs on barnacles, two in 1851 and two in 1854, which we discussed in our video, Darwin's Lesser Known Books. Darwin so single-mindedly focused on barnacles that his son asked when visiting a friend, quote, where does your father do his barnacles, close quote. Following British naturalist John Vaughn Thompson before him, Darwin argued that the morphology and larval stages of barnacles definitively tied them to the arthropods, not the mollusks, as Georges Cuvier and Richard Owen thought. The belief that barnacles are mollusks led to their German translation of Entenmuscheln, or duck muscle. Barnacles were for many years an example of a zoological detective story because no one had witnessed the full life cycle of one, and no one knew to which group they belonged. Starting at least in the 10th century AD, some people even speculated that barnacles were an ontogenetic stage of geese, such as the Brent goose, Branta bernicla. Why, you ask? Well, as zoologist Gerhard Schultz writes, quote, This view was based on the shape and color of pedunculated barnacles, such as lepus, with the stalk corresponding to the neck, and the cirri to the feathered tail of the geese, and was held to explain the fact that wooden branches covered with barnacles are often found on the shore, while the geese are absent during summer. According to this idea, there were trees on northern islands that grow the barnacles as fruits on their branches. If they are ripe, they metamorphose into geese, but sometimes branches with unripe specimens break off and are washed to European coasts, close quote. As a result of this belief, geese were considered vegetarian foods suitable for consumption during Lent or on Good Friday. There is a popular misconception that Pope Innocent III prohibited the eating of Brent geese at the Fourth Council of the Lateran in 1215 AD because he argued that they still behave like birds. However, there is no evidence he actually said this. The mistake seems to have originated with Dominican friar Vincent of Beauvais, who published numerous books about natural sciences around 1260 AD. Regardless, barnacles are sessile, filter-feeding crustaceans of the subclass Cirripedia surrounded by a calcareous shell. They begin life as drifting planktonic larvae and settle down onto a surface, such as a rock, whale, mangrove root, or ship. They are named for their legs, called cirri, which they kick out through the hole in their shell, nabbing food as it floats by. Barnacles have been hugely important for biology, for instance, being involved in the experiment that allowed zoologist Robert Payne to deduce the concept of a keystone species in the 1960s. Payne removed the carnivorous starfish Pisasterogracius from a section of Washington coastline and witnessed that, within just a few months, the common acorn barnacle, Bolanus glandula, had crowded out most of the animals that formerly lived at the surf. A year later, the barnacles themselves were being crowded out by faster reproducing smaller animals, like the mussel, Mytilus californianus, and the gooseneck barnacle, Polycipes polymeris. This led Payne to conclude that, quote, local species diversity is directly related to the efficiency with which predators prevent the monopolization of the major environmental requisites by one species, close quote. Cirripedia is divided into three clades, Acrothoracica, Thoracica, and Rhizocephala. The Acrothoracica are suspension feeders but lack mineralized plates. They bore into substrates and often live symbiotically with other invertebrates. Thoracica do have the mineralized plates, but these plates are not shed during molting. The rhizocephala have deviated from this peaceful lifestyle by becoming parasitic on other animals. Late in the larval cypress stage of female rhizocephalans, an infectious stage called the vermigon is injected into a host. The vermigon looks like an undifferentiated liquid-filled tube and lacks segmentation and internal organs. 
Similarly, the adult lacks appendages, segments, and internal organs except for gonads. Once attached to a host, the vermigon develops into an adult that consists of a network of root-like threads called the interna and an external sac-like structure called the externa. Aside from the larval stage, which Thompson too recognized puts rhizocephalans among the crustaceans, there is virtually nothing linking rhizocephalans to other arthropods. As for male rhizocephalans, their adult stage is the short-lived trichogen, which exists solely for reproduction. In the rhizocephalan order Echentrogonida, which is evidently polyphyletic, there isn't even a trichogen stage. The male cypress merely injects its amoeboid sperm-producing cells into the immature female externa, representing the simplest males in the entire animal kingdom. The oldest definitive barnacle fossils, the genus Prelepus, date to the middle Carboniferous some 330 to 320 million years ago. Priscancer marinus from the middle Cambrian some 510 to 500 million years ago was initially thought to be a barnacle, but it lacks convincing seropede features, and Cyprolepis from the late Silurian also lacks features that could definitively assign it to the barnacles. At best, Ramphoveriter from the Silurian, about 425 million years ago, might be a stem barnacle. Sister to the barnacles is the clade Ascothoracida, which also begins with the canonical Nopleus larval stage, but many of them too transform into root-like parasites on cnidarians and echinoderms. Hard to believe that Dendrogaster, with its fleshy tendrils, is a crustacean. In contrast, other members of Ascothoracida, like Bacalarius, look much more like typical shrimp. Ancestor to the clade containing Ascothoracida and the barnacles is Facetotecta. Barnacles are not the only animals whose phylogenetic position was elucidated by witnessing the completion of their ontogeny. Facetotecta was originally described in 1899, but their exact placement among crustaceans has been hotly debated until recently. The reason was that no one ever saw an adult facetotectin. In 2008, a team of researchers induced metamorphosis in a facetotectin cypress, and it morphed into an adult similar to the rhizocephalin vermigon, lacking segments, eyes, and a gut. This suggests that the adults are endoparasites. This story has an interesting parallel with certain anglerfish. Males were entirely unknown until it was realized that they were parasites on the females. Drastically deviating from how your cousin species look is not confined merely to the barnacles and their kin. Ant mimicry, or myrmecomorphy, is very common among arthropods, having evolved more than 70 times and encompassing greater than 2,000 species. Some arthropods use ant mimicry for protection, because ants are typically aggressive, social, and noxious, while others use it to get close to prey. An instance of the former, the North American ant mimic jumping spider, Picamia picata, was found by researchers to be preyed on by the larger jumping spider, Theodina prepara, a third of the time less than non-ant mimic spiders. Fascinatingly, myrmecomorphy for jumping spiders like myrmarachne comes at a cost. The more ant-like the spider looks, the more reduced its jumping abilities are. As for the latter, the parasitoid wasp Lysiflebus fabarum uses its myrmecomorphy to sneak among ants tending to aphids, allowing the wasp to insert its eggs into an aphid. Similarly, Richard Dawkins references the termite-mimicking beetle Coatinacthodes ovambolandicus in Climbing Mount Improbable. The rear half of the beetle's abdomen looks vaguely like a termite when viewed from the sides, but this vague resemblance is enough to pass among actual termites. The beetle lays its enlarged abdomen over its head and thorax, obscuring its true form. One family of flies, Foridae, has members who've independently evolved to live inside ant and termite colonies. Vestigipoda has lost its legs and wings and mimics ant larvae. It has cuticular hydrocarbons that mimic those of ants, causing adult ants to care for the helpless flies. One can find forids that are intermediate in their morphology between more traditional forid flies and the odd wingless interlopers, such as Eurypladia nanaknihali. This species is the world's smallest fly, measuring 0.4 millimeters in length and has highly reduced but still existent wings. 
Another forid, Thalmotoxina, lives in termite nests, and the females have only rudimentary front wings. The haltiers are lost completely. However, the males do possess wings. The point of the barnacle's tail is that arthropods can depart quite radically from the morphology of their relatives, whether that's the root-like body of Saculina and Dendrogaster, or the highly reduced form of Vestigipoda. If one could only observe these species as fossils, ascertaining their correct phylogenetic placement would likely be difficult, as it is with such forms as the Carboniferous bilaterian known as Tolemonstrum, or Sialomorpha from Cenozoic Amber. DNA is the key to uncovering relationships among organisms, and only having fossils to look at is why there has been such difficulty in assigning Cambrian and Precambrian organisms. As expected under evolution, organisms become more unlike modern ones the further one goes back in time, and once you go sufficiently far back, clades of organisms lose all the defining characteristics of their crown groups. That observation sets us up for the next tale, that of the Velvet Worm. So, thanks for watching, and we'll see you all next time.